Please welcome our panellists. First Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Gita Gopana. Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Algebras Investments, Davide Serra. Chairman of the Institute for International Finance, Axel Weber. And our moderator, Head of Economics and Government of Bloomberg Editorial and Research, Stephanie Flanders. Well, uh, Tom has set us up uh, nicely there. When inflation's the topic, the end of easy money, it would be very easy to spend the next half an hour raking over who made the biggest mistakes and why. We're not going to do that. We've already spent months doing that. Uh, we're going to think about where we are and what are the consequences for all of us, but particularly policymakers. Is this an inflationary episode or a new inflationary or potentially inflationary era? And if so, how does our macro policy toolkit developed for the different kind of times that Tom just described, how does that toolkit need to change? And we have a range of different perspectives uh, on that. But I'm going to start with you, Gita. Uh, first Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, we know inflation hits the poorest, hardest. Collectively, are policymakers now doing enough to confront this? I mean, and what are the risks that you see? Uh, firstly, it's a real pleasure to be here and to join this panel. I mean, Stephanie, without a doubt, one of the biggest challenges economies around the world are facing is inflation. Uh, and to bring inflation down at a time when growth is also slowing for other reasons because of other forms of uh, supply shocks. I, I think what central banks around the world have clearly recognized is that they need to move in a determined fashion to durably bring inflation down. And after a period of substantial rate increases. I mean, if you see the total amount of rate increases that we've seen in the US this past year, this is, there are a few parallels in terms of the last several decades. You see this much of an increase in such a short period of time. But that was needed to address the kind of inflation that we haven't seen in over four decades. So I think they're at a point where the US, the US Fed is at a point where they've raised interest rates around three, 375 basis points. They are uh, very likely to raise interest rates another round before the end of this year. Uh, and then the question is, what comes next? And I think 2023 is, for 2023, the question is more about how long are you going to keep these rates at the, at the levels? that they've moved them to. Uh, and we see a need to keep it at over 4% for all of 2023 for to be able to bring inflation down durably. And like you said, it's very important to do that because it's extremely regressive, a high levels of inflation. Now, there are countries at other different points in their cycle, but I focused on the US because in terms of spillovers to the rest of the world, US policies have the biggest effect. Axel, you're the former central banker uh, on this panel, and we should record that you were on the record early in warning about uh, inflation uh, at the end of uh, 2020. But you have now had at least 90 central banks raise interest rates this year, H at least half of them more than 70 or 75 basis points in a single go, which most of them had not done before. Are we now at a point where central banks can have a more leisurely, we're not talking pivots, but a more leisurely pace? No, I, I think, uh, as Gita was indicating, uh, as a central banker, 75 basis point moves are usually conducted over the last couple of decades only on the way down when you are, have been hit by a shock. And you were behind the curve by construction because something unexpected hit the economy, like in the financial crisis. On the way up, I think it's a mirror image, and again, we don't want to talk about the past, but it's a bit of a mirror image of being late, in my view, by design, from the inflation targeting regime that was adopted and therefore having to do faster steps because inflation didn't just rise from below 2% to just above 2% or 3% or 4% went all the way up to double digit. 
And that's where I think a lot of action was needed. If, if central banks have, have a dual mandate, which many of them have explicitly or implicitly, the most violated objective in the central bank objective function at the moment is inflation. It's way out of line with the target, whilst the employment and the economy has been holding up relatively well so far. And there is a new shock with the war in Ukraine that has added another negative supply shock to an already strained environment uh, that, that central banks were facing. So I don't think they're done. I think they got some more work to do. I think the belief in markets that central banks will go up and then come back in next year is, uh, in my view, uh, both premature and, and not ideal from a central bank point of view. And with Gita, they probably have to keep rates at which they go over the spring next year at that level for the remainder of the year and into 24 to bring inflation down towards their objective. And it'll take them two years to really be in the vicinity again of their objective bearing further shocks. But bearing further shocks, as we just saw, is a very brave assumption. And a lot of the things that are in the pipeline the transition to a greener economy, all of this will have inflationary impacts on energy prices and on other parts of life. So I think there is a likely scenario where you will see repeated shocks that will keep inflation high and more persistently high, despite central banks having adjusted monetary policy and having raised rates substantially, at least for the next year or two. And, and as we know, it's been discussed this week, it's not just the move to net zero, it's climate change itself also produces more volatile inflation. I think we're pretty clear on that. Davide, from the investor standpoint, where, where do you think we are on this road? I think a um, couple of numbers. The first one, if only in the last 50 years we have calculated, had the world priced carbon emission efficiently, today a bottle of $1 will be one fifty. So first of all, I think we have, in a way, a pay to price for what we haven't priced for 50 years. This, in my view, was not captured. Secondly, investors right now have this view, at least what's priced in the future, the rates are going to go lower. But here, the beauty of Bank of England, that has calculated the numbers for the last five centuries, is never in developed markets, when core inflation passes 5% for more than 12 months, they've been able to bring the core inflation number below 2 in less than 10 years. In some time, it took 30 years, only once in history in the last century in less than five years. So if history is of any help, I think rates here are going to stay higher for longer. And there are three reasons for it. The inflation shock comes from three main areas. The first one is green transition. The second one is the decoupling of the supply chain globally for geopolitical reasons. And third, remember, green transition requires materials which are no longer in an abundant space. You know, think about copper. We've been looking for copper for 2,000 years. We need to find more copper in the next 20 years than we've been finding in the last 2,000 years. Yeah? All right. And when you add then the adverse consequences of green transition and climate change on food, you add minerals, and then you add the war, you're creating an effect that's why I think inflation is going to be structurally slightly higher. Then, if you think that we had in developed market, US and Europe, 25% of fiscal stimulus in 2020, 21. And 2020 was needed because of COVID. 2021, honestly, was a bit of a giveaway. And hence, that's positive for the simple reason that now people have better balance sheet. You see it in the US. So a recession is likely to be less you know, shallow, we're not going to be a hard recession. And as a result, I think central bank can keep rates higher. So I think if the market is wrong, rates ain't going to go down as fast as people think. Do you, Kisa, do you, does the IMF buy into the, I mean, because as Davide, in a sense, is running together both things. There's the current inflation shock that people are dealing with, and then these longer term trends. And people have thought that maybe this was a sneak preview to those, but he's kind of saying, we're already there. Do, do you buy into that, that we're, we're already in this structurally higher inflation world? Not fully. I would say the following, which is what is true, is we are likely entering a period where supply shocks will play a bigger role than they did in the last two decades. And supply shocks include shocks that come from uh, climate, but also I think risks in terms of economic fragmentation around the world, what could happen to global trade. I think those risks 
uh, play uh, and could play an important role. So we probably are entering an era where for central banks, they really have a trade-off to deal with. They didn't have a trade-off. I mean, it was for the last couple of decades, they could keep reducing the unemployment rate and not see any inflation. They didn't really have a trade-off to deal with, but now they actually are likely to have a, a more serious trade-off to deal with. But to the question of the inflation that we're seeing now, I would not start with the green transition of climate as being the, the leading factor for it. I think what we had was a very unique period uh, of the pandemic, uh, now the war, uh, and we've seen very extraordinary recoveries that have come along with very large amounts of support that was provided uh, during the worst time of the pandemic uh, in terms of both monetary policy support and also especially fiscal policy support to people with high levels of savings. And now you're seeing that money being spent. And alongside, you do have a supply side problem too, which is that in markets like the US and the UK, uh, labor supply hasn't come back to what it was pre-pandemic. You still have the pandemic hitting other parts of the world. In China, we're seeing cases going up. That's affecting supply chains. So I think those are the main factors. I still do believe monetary policy works in the traditional way of reducing demand by raising interest rates, and we are seeing that happen uh, in, uh, in the US and in other co countries. It's going to take some time. I don't think it's going to take what was many, many decades, like David <laughs> said. But I, again, uh, so I would make that distinction, I mean, about what we're trying to solve now and what the risks are the, that are on the horizon. I mean, Axel, uh, we, this is supposed to be about, we're, we're, trying to fo we're focusing on policy making. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, we've seen, I mean, the UK had some of its own problems, but it also, there was a structural issue which many countries face of balancing now in this more challenging world, the fiscal and the monetary. Do you think we have the right sense of what that, how fiscal and monetary needs to work together or not work together in this environment? Yeah, so uh, two things, uh, and I think David uh, alluded to it. One thing you have to see is that what happened after COVID, namely a massive expansion of balance sheets of governments, financed largely by uh, emissions uh, and purchases of sovereign debt into the balance sheet of a central bank, was a coordinated extension of balance sheets on the sides of the central bank, roughly to the tune of 25% of global GDP and of governments. And a lot of that, unlike in the financial crisis, was going to private households in forms of paychecks and really increased demand. So there was quite a demand stimulus that we saw, necessary so in 2020, but it was kept in place, at least from the monetary side, way too long. And I think that is part why we saw inflation. The other side we haven't talked about is the balance sheets, really what will happen with them in the future. Now, if you look at the S&P 500 and you look at the you know, added balance sheet of the major three central banks, Europe, Japan, and uh, the US, you see a very high correlation between how financial markets have been performing and the liquidity put into the system by the central banks. Now, going forward, central banks don't just raise rates. They're also reducing their balance sheet. And actually, if you look at Europe, because some of the liquidity was provided through long-term financing operations that have an end date and not being prolonged, a lot of this excess liquidity will go relatively fast in the short period of early next year. And then the reduction of balance sheet will add to a downdraft that will continue to draw liquidity structurally out of the markets. And so the price for liquidity and the price for investments will, in my view, in the future be quite a bit higher. Not just because interest rates have risen, so the price for liquidity has gone up, but also the amount of liquidity available is going to be much lower than we've seen in the past. And what you saw in the UK was actually because of a financial stability concern, the central bank that was actually on course for reducing its balance sheet, had to intervene in the market and pump liquidity in for three days, as Andrew Bailey announced at the IF meeting in Washington, D.C., in order to stabilize some of the uh, sort of strategies of, Swiss, uh, of, of uh, uh, UK pension funds that use derivative instruments and therefore got an exposure to strong movements in financial markets. So I wouldn't be surprised if we have further episodes in the market 
where that combined rate increase and withdrawal of liquidity will lead to pocket of weaknesses in financial markets because of leverage strategies getting called and not being able to be uh, continued as they are. I mean, how dangerous is it to have quantitative tightening, the shrinking of central bank balance sheets continue? Because after that period, the Bank of England did go forward with its policy. And we had traditionally said it was a tool, even when the balance sheet was going up, when it was going down, it was a tool that was less well understood than the impact of interest rates. So is it dangerous for central banks to keep plowing ahead? I think it's dangerous if they don't understand where the leverage is. So let's think about the UK. Okay, do they? Yes, well, that's the question. 7% current account deficit compared to plus one in Europe and plus one in the States, and 7% fiscal deficit. So when I was a young kid, I was told you had to add the two, that's 14% twin deficit, no other G20 country has it. So at the time where they eased fiscally, rather than tightening, then they discovered that some of this UK pension plan had seven times gearing, seven times. We, as a you know, regulated asset manager, cannot have even 0.1 times leverage. We need to have cash at any point in time. So I think the central bank here and the regulator didn't quite understood what LDI was and how geared the pension system was. Secondly, this are having, in my view, a ripple effect then on three items. The first and the most important, the housing market. You know, we talk about stocks and bonds, but they are one times global GDP. Real estate is four to five times global GDP. So as soon as house prices starts coming off, people balance sheets are becoming weaker. You see it in the UK, mortgages, max three years duration, they're gonna reset from one to five to 6%. Well, that's an increase. And as a result, I think central banks will not be able to go immediately in quantitative tightening at the time at which they're rising, exactly for Axel point. Because if then you're gonna put a premium on liquidity, then you're gonna create the situation that you had in the UK, for two weeks, no one could get a mortgage mortgage offer are being redrawn. That's the price of liquidity. Mm -hmm. And so I think we will probably see central bank keeping the assets they have. By the way, for 10 years we haven't seen inflation, so the world is designed to have inflation around two to three. We had zero for 10 years. It's great that we're gonna have three, four for the next 10. It's just simply that, you know, when you do an average over 20 years, probably the number is gonna end up being about right. Yep. And hence, we need some inflation because the only way to deflate debt to GDP is through inflation. That's what always happened in history. Gita, one of the places you look to think about hidden financial stability risks is the IMF's Global Financial Stability Report. Do you, do you agree that we put, there are potentially some sort of unexploded consequences out there for, for quantitative tightening in central bank balance sheets? Well, I think, uh, without a doubt, there are significant segments of the financial market that live in the shadows, that are not well regulated. Uh, we call them non-bank financial institutions. And that is where we are likely to be surprised. And that's what happened in the UK. So as our global financial stability report uh, showed, that when you do a global stress test for the banking system, Advanced economy banks are quite resilient uh, to some very serious downside scenarios. Emerging market banks, less so. So in a very severe downside scenario, which is in the GFSR, we have about 30% of emerging markets who breach minimum capital requirements. So that's a pretty serious event. But I think the real unknown is the non-bank financial system. And that's exactly where we have hidden leverage, where we have uh, you know, dark corners, which, which come up only when things get really difficult, like we saw in the UK. So that's something that we are worried about. More generally, in terms of the financial conditions at the moment, uh, we see a distinction between you know, investment-grade assets, which everywhere around the world, but trade, uh, the spreads are quite low. They, you haven't seen much movement there. But if you look at frontier markets, that's where you're seeing a lot of stress already. We have about 60% of low-income countries that are already in high debt distress, and about 25% of emerging markets. Now, that does not make a systemic debt crisis, for sure. 
Uh, but again, we are in very risky times. Like it's, you know, the war is not over, the pandemic is not over, and uh, we haven't won the fight against inflation. So interest rates may need to go up much more than any of us would like it to, and, and uh, we have to see what happens then. And I'm interested in this policy mix, and particularly, you know, the, U the UK ha does have its own problems. It also potentially has the financial wherewithal and the history to, to, to overcome those appalling statistics that David is. But Argentina is another country that potentially faces a fiscal monetary tension in the current environment. It's got a, a lot of debt, a uh, lot of it borrowed from the IMF. It has some of the highest inflation rates in South America. What's your advice to them about how to balance those two? No, in Argentina, there is no tension between what fiscal policy and monetary policy need to do. They all have to move in the exact same direction, which is they have to be uh, on the restrictive side. Uh, you know, that's part of the I IMF program, which uh, working with the authorities that uh, was agreed on, which is, uh, you know, what Argentina... But if it tanks the economy, then that... Sorry? If it tanks the economy, then that doesn't support... It, it, so... There's one way that we know how to bring inflation down, which requires reducing demand in the economy. The Argentina economy is growing at a healthy rate. It's, there are headwinds to it at this moment, also from external shocks. But, you know, having inflation now is over 70%. And uh, if we want to have durable growth, we know that you need to bring inflation down. So just to make a point to what Davide said, which is inflation helps with debt to GDP, clearly not the case. On a long-term basis, Argentina, for instance, is an example where once you live in a high inflation environment, that gets priced into your interest rates, and then there's no gain at all in having that kind of inflation. So yes, you have a very short-term benefits because there's surprise inflation and you're you borrowed at low rates and you have surprised inflation, so you can bring that to GDP down. But from the experience we know, that is not a durable way to bring that to GDP uh, down. In Argentina, if I may, Argentina is an outlier here. If you look at actually what Guita's job would have been in any of the previous cycles, you would have not seen the stability of many of the emerging markets that front loaded some of the interest rate increases before the established central banks did in order to prevent outflows from their markets into the US and other markets. So in a way, Argentina is a special case. It only came back in the market uh, and in being able to load up international debt not so long ago. It uh, was in default for a long period of time and it's a special case. But emerging markets have been amazingly resilient so far but the problem is, is frontier markets, the, the weakest and poorest economies, because they're facing massive de distress. There is a likely rating cycle that is going to set in where even those that are just about investment grade might get downgrades to sub-investment grade. And many of the markets we talk about don't even have an investment grade. So they're not in the typical bank portfolios or fund portfolios, but still the stress from rising interest rates on these markets, which are the poorest economies of this world, it's gonna be massive. And that's where at this late interest rate cycle, because you know, ten inflation tends to be global. It doesn't just stick to one country or to one region. It tends to be pretty global through commodity prices uh, and through oil and, and others. And that's where these countries are hit at a very important point in time in a very negative way. David, are we going to be talking much more about sovereign debt in developed and developing economies next year, having spent the last year really focused on monetary policy? Uh, not in developed market, because I think we've seen in the UK... Not in the Eurozone? No, because I think there's one advantage, currency. Mm -hmm. Remember, the currency market is adjusting fast. You have seen it in Europe, you know, we're paying 5 to 6% for hydrocarbon, um, gas and oil more compared to the United States, and immediately the currency is adjusted. In the UK, the pound has adjusted fast over the last 20, 30 years in the gap in productivity. I think in emerging markets, then there's a distinction. Those that, produ that are food producer are in a good shape. The issue here with the war is those that don't have enough food, they need to import food. So Sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt, we've seen in Sri Lanka, so if I have a problem in the food supply chain with rising rates and high level of debt, it might end up being an absolute catastrophe. And so I think here, actually, where we need to be all worried, even from a social perspective. 
financial markets, I think the adjustments in fixed income has mainly happened because you know when we're pricing five percent US rates and three in Europe, they're not gonna you know they're not gonna go out of control. We also think the inflation short term has kind of peaked. Why? Every industry has restocked up. And so we're long inventory. A simple data point. When Apple has ever given a discount to consumer, well it's giving discount now for selling the you know MacBook PC. So you have an evidence. And at the same time the labor market is cooling off. We have seen you know every corporation is doing the classical five to ten percent adjustment on labor force. I'm not spoken to a single CEO, single entrepreneur, then it's not tightening by five to ten percent the belt across industry. Well, I, I think David had just alluded to something very important. We're starting to see the first round effects of inflation come off. And why central banks have to keep at it is to prevent second round inflationary effects and from this to become embedded in the wage price mechanism of the economy. Because once people start believing they should index their contracts to 4 or 5% inflation as opposed to 2, that's where it becomes very long lasting and embedded in the economy. And that's why in, this, in the 70s it was so hard to get rid of inflation because it had become embedded in the economy. We still have the chance to prevent that, but it requires determined action that markets and, and uh, market participants will see inflation is going to come down over a reasonable period of time, not a decade. I would say two years, three years at the most, and that helps you anchor inflation expectations. They've not run away, so we're not yet lost this inflation battle, but I think we need to be really focused on that now for the, for the period to come, uh, at least for the next couple of months. Gita, just a, a quick response to that. So, I mean, do you, do you agree that we've not finished, we've dealt with the first round, but we still need to be very cautious about second round effects? But I think also what Davide said, because we've had warnings from the European Central Bank just in the last couple of days. Do you agree that there's not likely to be any issues around sovereign debt in the Eurozone in the next year or two? So, uh, agree with Axel on uh, the fact that it is very important for central banks to stay the course. Uh, we've had false dawns before. One in good inflation reading does not make a trend. And we have enough lessons from history of central banks who have kind of moved, changed course too quickly uh, and then created an even bigger problem that required grinding the economy to a halt and even deeper recessions uh, than would have happened in, if they had just stayed the course. So I think that's absolutely right. And we are there at this point that we should, that these central banks should stay the course. In terms of, uh, sovereign debt issues in, uh, in the Euro area. Firstly, I think that there have been a lot of important developments in the European Union, in the Euro area, compared to the previous, the GFC. You have the European Stability Mechanism that is there to help countries deal with uh, surprise events or sudden tightening in market liquidity. The ECB has uh, put in place the Transmission Protection Mechanism, which, is ex you know, which is, will help them uh, raise interest rates, but ensure that you don't have very disorderly market conditions uh, in certain sovereign debt markets. So I think that they have more instruments in place, better, be, better mechanisms in place to protect themselves uh, this time around. But, uh, but the, there's still question marks about Italy? Or your, do you think we're on a path now where Italy will be able to sustain the kind of increase in borrowing costs we've seen? I think we're in a time when there is a lot of uncertainty. So, like I said, the war is not over. We haven't seen the end of the energy crisis. This winter is turning out to be uh, warmer, and that really helps. But the bigger problem is next winter. So all of that means that the ability to raise resources to repay your debt, you know, those, those challenges will remain. Uh, you know, at the same time, uh, I do think that there's been an improvement in policy making and there's been an improvement in institutions that should help safeguard against worse outcomes. Kitty Kopinas, Davide Sara, Axel Weber, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.